Hi, welcome to Vietnam Real Estate Insights, the program that looks at the Vietnamese real estate market and the emerging trends with industry experts. I'm your host, Harlow Russell. Today, we're speaking with David Jackson, the General Director of Colliers Vietnam, and we'll be talking about the opportunities and the challenges of investing your money in Vietnamese property. David, hello and welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time today. David, I'll, uh, I'd like to tell our uh, audience a little bit about you. Uh, you've been in Vietnam and Asia eight years, and you are a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors and have a master's degree in surveying. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Great. Thank you. And you're also a, a lead green associate, which I understand is leadership in energy and environmental design from the U.S. Green Building Council. That's correct, yes. Right, so a lot of expertise. I know that many people look to you as a property expert in Vietnam and discuss uh, investment opportunities with you. Lovely, it's a great introduction. Thank you very much. Great. Well, let's start off with, uh, in summary, uh, in Vietnam in 2015, what's happened, particularly with a focus on the commercial and retail and office uh, property market? What's happened here so far this year? Um, well, it's been a it's been a, a very uh, a year of change. Mm. Um, recently, this year, I think um, legal system has changed, uh, yeah. allowing for increased investment from uh, institutional investors, from foreigners, um, from and allowing for investment internally. The, there's a lot more uh, drive from the government to uh, encourage growth in the economy uh, here in Vietnam. Uh, one must always remember the demographics here in Vietnam, where uh, we have a large amount of people that are literate, that are educated. We have a, a movement from uh, the countryside to increasing urbanization. We have a growing middle class here. So there are very strong demographics here in Vietnam. And to follow and, and combine that, there is a stable and political environment here, which is encouraged encouraging investment uh, into Vietnam. Oh, very good. Well, in terms of commercial and office property, let's say from uh, 2013 to 14, how has the, the, the market uh, uh, grown or changed uh, so far this year? We're about a, almost to the end of the year now. Um, so Vietnam has had a few uh, changes over the years. In, in the last year, depending on which sub-market we're talking about, whether we're talking about Ho Chi Minh City or Hanoi or even Da Nang, um, there's been a, lo a lot of changes. Um, a lot of these changes have been driven uh, internally uh, uh, in Vietnam and from the government here. Um, and a lot of the legal structure has changed. So uh, in commercial practice, which also knocks on to residential, um, the, the legal system has changed to allow foreign ownership in certain areas, uh, uh, particularly residential. Mm -hmm. um, it has allowed uh, uh, subleases mm -hmm. to happen. So if you are a, in an office building, you could sublease out. You could always kind of do it before, but okay. there's a bit more clarification in the laws there. Okay. Or if you're an investor in industrial, you could uh, look at industrial sites purchasing them and subleasing them. Um, uh, and the other thing is financially as well, the, the movement to transfer assets and land uh, as share ownership if you own a, a company that owns a land plot, it's a lot easier uh, than previously. So the legal systems, government kind of uh, uh, encouraging growth here uh, in commercial practice has meant that uh, uh, there are a lot more people looking to invest. Uh, a lot more people looking into Vietnam, and, it, and Vietnam has become uh, a, a cheaper alternative maybe to investing in China mm. and other places. So companies like Samsung, mm -hmm. uh, who are investing heavily in here, uh, obviously with their uh, investments coming in here, there is a, a follow-up from the supporting kind of companies that they do. So uh, Vietnam's looking very positive. Oh, that's very good. Well, if we talk about a, a retail investor or an individual investor, who maybe has commercial property in other countries and wants to add to his or her portfolio, what would be the typical structure of buying commercial property or commercial office space, again, investment, from an investment standpoint, in Vietnam if you were an individual investor or 
uh, as opposed to a, a large multinational. Um, okay, uh, quite a few different options there. Mm -hmm. Actually, from from uh, as I mentioned, the change in law. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the having the ability. Um, with certain caveats to sublease uh, um, means that there are options available uh, nowadays in terms of uh, maybe uh, purchasing a long-term uh, lease on a, on a building or mm -hmm. on a uh, office floor and then subleasing them to another tenant. Mm, yes. if, you're a, if you're a commercial company, yes. uh, the idea of, of maybe purchasing a, uh, a building uh, subleasing out part of those buildings for an income yes. uh, and then slowly as your company grows here uh, uh, reclaiming back the space so you grow into your own development. Yes. Um, at the moment uh, because the change in law is quite recent uh, um, we, we July, July uh, that's yes. right the first of July we um, we haven't seen a great deal of that happening but because the ability is there to do that uh, and because people are now looking uh, into Vietnam as an investment long-term opportunity uh, people are looking to, to spend uh, a higher capital, capital appreciation uh, and maybe have the gains over the, the year of, of, the, of the tenure. Mm, mm, I see. It, uh, speaking of capital gain and yield, in commercial property or retail property or office space, uh, in Vietnam, what is the generally the primary advice or focus? Is it on yield, rental yield? Or is it on capital gain? How do you define the, the Vietnamese market for an investor in commercial property related to yield versus gain? Uh, okay, quite an interesting question. Um, for me, uh, if we are, uh, if I can divert a little bit and talk sure. about residential, sure. um, there, the Vietnamese local market fully understands capital gain. So if I buy uh, a property, an apartment at uh, X, and then two months later it's worth Y, yes. uh, I've made that money. Um, actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, obviously, if you're looking at um, yields, uh, if you buy uh, at the Y price um, and the rental or the secondary market that you're renting at uh, is still lower, then your yield is lower. Um, and I think that there are, in Vietnam at the moment, due to uh, the changes in law due to the demographics here, a lot of middle class and growing speculators in the market mm. that are buying for investment opportunities, mm. um, I think they might encounter problems in a couple of years time uh, because the, the secondary market, maybe in rental, retail, uh, residential, sorry, properties uh, might not be there on the scale that they're developing at the moment, mm. uh, which means that in two years time, uh, when people are looking to rent uh, uh, for investment opportunities, there might be too much stock on the market, lowering the rental price that they can get, and maybe even causing void periods and, and some financial difficulties for people. And based on that, do you, see, do you see the market right now as going into a speculative mode or, or just being naturally cautious of the speculators? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm very positive in, in Vietnam. Vietnam is an is amazing place to be right now. There's a lot of investment happening. Um, I think traditionally here, um, there is a, uh, uh, a feeling of a quick gain. Um, and so if I can buy now and I can move it on to somebody else and make a percentage difference in a short time, I'm, I'm a winner. Um, actually, uh, what happens is here that it gets passed from one person to another. Uh, and there are so much development, so much stock uh, entering the market right now mm. um, that, I, that are, I think that there will be a case where the, 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 the buck will be passed from one person to the other and whoever's holding that uh, property or that asset at the end could be in trouble. So for example, uh, a lot of the developers that are happening at the moment, um, there is so much stock on coming at the moment Are into the market. Uh, um, I'm talking about residential, but actually the same really applies uh, commercially. Um, so uh, commercially, uh, in, in office buildings, mm. because of the population uh, here and because of the size of some of the developments that people are building, you can see this in Hanoi uh, maybe a couple of years ago when Kinam Landmark Tower comes onto the market, it doubles the commercial office space yes. in Hanoi overnight. Yes. Now, this is clearly going to be causing a bit of issues on the rental rates 
around town uh, and asking rates that, that landlords are offering. Um, the same goes with developments happening in Ho Chi Minh City on residential. Um, the developer who wants to increase sales are offering uh, lower percentage discounts uh, to buy on block sales to other uh, distributors uh, who are then lowering their percentages and moving that on and so forth. But uh, clearly um, what, uh, as a consulting company, what we would like to see would be sustained growth uh, but make sure that it's stable uh, rather than fluctuating or, or cylindrical. Mm. Well, you mentioned uh, example in Hanoi. Uh, let's talk about the three major cities of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, Hanoi and Da Nang in the middle. Mm, from your standpoint in terms of the advice you give or the investment advice, uh, are there major differences between the three cities, between the three markets in terms of uh, investment uh, for commercial and retail property? Um, Vietnam is a, is a, a very a large country uh, and so it's very diverse in terms of its population um, and culturally wise it's very diverse. So uh, whilst Ho Chi Minh City is the economic kind of hub, uh, Hanoi is the, the place of political power um, and just culturally there is a bit of difference from the investment and the opportunities that are uh, presented in those environments. Um, what we would see is uh, that there's a lot of red tape probably in the north and culturally uh, in terms of contracts uh, the southern being a lot more uh, western in nature um, deals can happen uh, with a lot more fluidity okay. uh, whereas the uh, in in the north in Hanoi there's a lot more red tape sometimes mm. uh, and and when we're consulting we have to be very careful uh, to investors to let them know in terms of timing it can take considerably a long time to do an investment deal uh, in Vietnam or any transaction in Vietnam. Um, and what we're seeing in places like Da Nang, Da Nang has had a, a recent growth over the last couple of years. Um, and a lot of the foreign direct uh, investment is happening there. There's lots of uh, growth happening there in Da Nang. Uh, and the, the, we have an international airport uh, coming in there, which is increasing sort of trade and transport. But the market is a lot smaller. Um, transactions, um, you know, uh, have a bit more care around them. Um, but obviously, clearly, economically, and where the business and a lot of our consulting occurs would be Ho Chi Minh City. Mm, that's interesting. So, what you mentioned is potentially things can move a little bit slower in Hanoi than Ho Chi Minh, as as a generality. Um, I think it depends on the deals. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Vietnam, uh, not just saying this because I have a vested interest, but I think you need good consulting advice. Okay. You need to understand uh, the parties that are dealing and, and what's happening there. Uh, and ne not necessarily, um, the whilst the project might look good on paper, yes. it might be too good to be true. And okay. so having good consulting advice at a, at a ground level here is probably essential. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of the gotchas of investing in Vietnam. Let's say you are an institutional fund or, or a property fund of some type uh, without any exposure to Vietnam and you're interested to, to add to that portfolio uh, with commercial or retail space particularly. What would be some of the gotchas that you would uh, tell any new investor to this market uh, to be aware of and where do you need to also uh, put, um, shall we say, maybe some additional consulting resources to make sure that you know you're you're making a good investment here. Um, sure. Well, uh, of course, uh, each fund is different, and each fund has different uh, uh, risk uh, uh, um, profiles. Yes. Um, what I would always advise for anyone investing in Vietnam is to have a diversified portfolio. Okay. Um, so uh, you know that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Okay, um, for me, uh, let's say the, the fund had 100 million to invest. Okay. Um, so if they had 100 million to invest, again, divorce, diversified portfolio. Mm -hmm. I would look at buying maybe some land that's ready for development. I would look at maybe investing in income producing assets. Um, I would maybe even, uh, because I'm a real estate guy, look at investing in some of the, uh, the developers in Vietnam that are already up and running into that in, t in terms of stocks and, and, and shares uh, that are listed companies. Um, however, if I had a hundred million to invest, 
the issue in Vietnam is basically finding uh, a mix of projects okay. or the right project. Yes. Um, there are very limited projects that are on a larger scale um, that are, are for sale, that, that you can invest in. Um, there is a, a, a limited stock because the, the people that have invested in it um, have invested it probably in the last 10 or 15 years. They're quite happy with their income producing asset here. They're quite happy with their um, position in Vietnam. And to, as an investor coming in, knowing what the right yield is on a building, knowing what the right value is on a building, um, generally I think there's things available to buy, but whether they're the right uh, for, the, for the institutional investor is, is a different story. Well, you've raised a good question about knowing whether it's a good price, a good project, uh, particularly in terms of pricing, uh, it can be very difficult to get information in Vietnam or to get accurate information. So, for example, uh, if a fund is coming in and looking to do, as you said, uh, $100 million and perhaps buying a number of things, how, does, um, uh, how do you determine if an asking price for, particularly for land or commercial property or uh, retail office space is, is, is reasonable or realistic. Uh, how do you do that in a country like Vietnam? Um, okay, so <laughs> I, I, I'm smiling there because you know the first thing that you would do is you look at uh, somebody who does have experience on a, on a ground level, uh, maybe like Collier's International. Like Collier's, yeah. um, but actually, it depends on the asset. And it so if it's uh, obviously if it's an income producing asset, uh, we would look at uh, the yields that you would receive from that um, and obviously look at the, the, probably the main thing is the, the land use rights certificate to see what is available there um, and what, what is being constructed and how that uh, will produce you revenue on, on what terms. Um, in terms of land and, and whether the land is valued there, again it's, it's having an understanding of the market here that um, in terms of what you can build, what the highest and best use might be, um, and it's looking at the uh, the profile of the person who's who's purchasing it. The land value will stay the same, but it might take time to convert it into uh, other land use types and things like that. So, the an in, an investor must kind of understand the legal structure here in Vietnam, which is is um, decree law. It's not the law of precedent like in in the UK um, uh, or Hong Kong. So, so understanding the, the, the details in the law will, will make an investment maybe a good investment or a bad investment. You mentioned decree law. Maybe you could share with us what, what does that mean, uh, particularly as compared to uh, how real estate is valued or, or titled in other countries? Um, okay, so uh, if it was uh, English law, um, is normally the law of um, precedent, which means that there's a case history uh, uh, Kramer versus Kramer or something like that um, and, and there is a, a ruling that people can follow through because it's been judged on previously. Okay. Decree law um, here is slightly different because it, Vietnam is the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, it's still a communist country and, and the, the decrees are set by the various ministries and the, and the government here um, to outline uh, rules and regulations and structure. Um, from everything from farming to finance, um, uh, etc. So, decree law, um, similar to the law that changed this, l this year, uh, involving uh, real estate and subleasing, etc., um, is generally uh, outlined by the government, and then the different sort of parties in the different districts look at how that's um, interpreted and, and, and they follow. Uh, 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 guidance and advice from, from central government. From your experience, uh, David, uh, in a country where there is decree law, does that necessarily mean that it's uh, a, a worse country or more difficult country to uh, make a good investment in uh, versus others, or uh, doesn't it, 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 it doesn't matter? Um, I think it always matters. Uh, the w when I when I've uh, because I'm uh, still a foreign national. Whenever I hear decree law, I start to worry, mm. thinking it sounds very severe yes. and very structured. Yes. Um, actually, the reality is it's it's guidance from the government that they interpret, um, 
And, and the reason that, that uh, some transactions, as I mentioned earlier, take a longer period of time is because sometimes the interpretation is, is different for different people or parties or um, in terms of, of uh, uh, projects. Uh, um, so um, the red tape takes a little bit longer of time. Uh, for an investor, it, it does mean that you can look at something and uh, there is some doubts and there's some concerns normally. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, do I think it hinders pro progress here? Probably not. Okay. It's just a different type. And, and it, so if you're a foreign investor, you, you have to understand that. And again, I would advise to seek uh, good legal advice. Yes, it sounds like uh, besides having good real estate advice, having good legal advice and, and, and business uh, advice is very important here in Vietnam. Sure. Um, very good. Um, so uh, if, uh, if you had uh, funds and you were looking around Southeast Asia region at this point, uh, to invest in commercial and retail property particularly. Um, would you be bullish uh, or bearish on Vietnam in 2016? Okay, um, well, I mean, first of all, looking around the region, uh, if I had money to invest, uh, there are obviously uh, areas that might be profitable. Um, you might look at um, uh, Burma, uh, in terms of uh, commercial hotel premises, office mm -hmm. space at the moment, that it is doing quite well. You might look at uh, retail in Bangkok. Um, but actually, um, the, the market that I would invest in is Vietnam. Uh, uh, now, uh, I'm saying that because I work in this environment, and actually, uh, when I first arrived here, 2008, um, obviously there was a global downturn in yes. the economy. And now I can see um, it, the direction it's heading. I can see the focus, uh, the stable political environment, uh, the dynamics are here, the laws are changing for increased investment. Um, and also this urbanization that's occurring, there are, if you uh, have selected the right projects to invest in or, or the right land, um, clearly uh, because of the urbanization, there'll be an upturn in the land prices in, in some areas where an MTR line is coming in, mm. the, the land prices you, you would expect to rise. Um, I think investors probably in Southeast Asia in the early 80s, um, you know, who made a lot of money in places like Bangkok uh, and uh, Manila, mm -hmm. um, probably would look to Vietnam now that it has got a st stable structure. Mm -hmm. With companies like Samsung coming here, clearly they, they feel the same way. Um, in addition to that, uh, Vietnam also has uh, entered the uh, TPP agreement, yes. the Trans-Pacific uh, yeah. Partnership, increasing trade uh, um, between uh, Vietnam and other companies, uh, countries. Um, and the Asian community, uh, clearly 60% of the world population lives in this area. And I think people see um, trade improving, they see regulation improving. Um, and so Vietnam has uh, ticks all the boxes, I think. What you have to be careful from mm. is investing in the right project. Mm. Um, you can invest in projects here uh, where in terms of profitability, um, it's the death by a thousand cuts. What might look good on the way in yes. um, after you, you've been in the project for a while might not look so good in terms of profitability and return on revenue. Mm. Um, and again, that comes down to uh, understanding the local market, understanding the structure here. But, uh, but uh, I would definitely invest in Vietnam rather than anywhere else. Oh, well, that's a that's very, very strong statement. Uh, just a couple of other questions. Uh, we didn't talk about shopping malls at all, uh, but there's certainly a lot more shopping malls that are being built, particularly with, from foreign developers uh, uh, from Singapore, from Korea, uh, from Japan. Uh, in terms of an investment opportunity, wh what does that mean uh, for the global investor? Is there a particular uh, interesting niche here if we talk about uh, shopping centers and, and the growth of uh, modern shopping centers uh, here in Vietnam? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of shopping centers, uh, uh, Vietnam, I, I think you're probably right. Uh, uh, there is huge growth here because there's a huge population here. Yes. Um, what I would say is, uh, um, and to anyone that's looked at uh, tenant mixes and design of shopping malls, it is a finite science, uh, and to get it right is uh, uh, you have to do a lot of research and make sure mm -hmm. the structure's there. Um, do I think Vietnam has got there yet? Probably not. Okay. Um, in terms of shopping malls, there is a kind of, uh, if you build it, 
uh, they will come, a Kevin Costner attitude, um, rather than looking at the mix itself, looking at what might be the US the unique selling point uh, of that shopping mall. Uh, in terms of uh, commercial um, shopping malls, the, the dynamics have changed here in Vietnam, uh, socially. So, uh, whereas before a family might live in a house uh, with three generations under the roof and a retail premise on the lower floor, yes. um, there's a movement away to that, to bigger shopping malls. Um, so, shopping malls such as Aeon Mall, uh, Vivo City, yes. uh, have, have come around in the last couple of years that cater for a almost like a family pool, an event to go there to shop around. Whether people have, are buying at the moment is a, is a different matter, but um, I think that big shopping centers and big shopping companies are clearly eyeing, eyeing Vietnam and investing in Vietnam. Investment from Korean and Japanese into Vietnam, uh, uh, companies and organizations and retail, uh, is increasing because they, the borrowing ratio in Vietnam, uh, in, sorry, Korea, and Japan is quite good, so they can almost invest into Vietnam, into other projects, and get a good return mm. on that. Wow, that's very interesting. Well, David, uh, uh, thanks so much for your insights and your expertise. Uh, that concludes our interview uh, today with David Jackson, the General Director of Collier's Vietnam. Uh, thank you for your time and sharing your expertise with us. Very fascinating. Lots of questions and, and lots of detail. Uh, so sure. thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Harley. Thank you for the time. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, with Vietnam Real Estate Insights. Uh, we hope you've also uh, gained a lot from uh, the experience and knowledge of our guest speaker today. We will continue to offer uh, these insights on a monthly basis, and we look forward to having you come join us again. I'm Harlow Russell. Thanks, and have a good day. <laughs>